Well, Nicola Sturgeon is the first minister of Scotland and as such has pledged to continue Scotland's world leading action on the climate crisis. She is currently in Katowice, Poland, where leaders from around the globe are meeting to discuss the fight against the crisis at COP24, where she joins us now via satellite for a conversation with former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, First Minister. Uh, I have been uh, a fan of your leadership for a long time. I congratulate you on the initiatives you're taking. Uh, and as you know, we are focused on the climate crisis and its solutions with a particular impact on health uh, consequences that flow from the climate crisis. But in more general terms, mm -hmm. my first question to you, first of all, welcome and thank you for joining us. Tell us uh, about the current climate impacts you. you're seeing in uh, rural and urban areas uh, of Scotland. Well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to join you. It's a pleasure uh, to talk to you about such an important issue for my country and for countries right across the globe. Uh, like other countries, I've just watched your presentation on the UK. We're already seeing extreme weather the likes of which we've not been used to. Uh, greater rainfall, uh, unusually for Scotland, some heat waves in the most recent summer. Uh, we are seeing that impact already and we know that that impact is going to continue. You know, estimates are that even if we minimise emissions, sea levels by the end of the century will rise by around half a metre. And Scotland accounts for more than 10% of Europe's coastline. We have 100 inhabited islands. Many of our iconic industries, fishing and whisky, rely heavily on climate sensitive natural resources. So the impacts for us, as they will be for countries across the globe, are going to be significant. And that makes it more important that we show real leadership both in mitigating climate change, but also leading in terms of adaptation as well. Well, uh, great, and I'm, I'm glad you're in Katowice. I'm going to be there uh, in a few days, and I, I hope these meetings go well. Yeah. Uh, my family's roots on my father's side go back to Scotland. I was reminded of that when I hear the Scottish accent. It always has a, a hold on me. Uh, but uh, I want to ask the, <laughs> a second question. Why do you think it's especially important for governmental leaders to consider the health impacts of the climate crisis when making policy decisions? Well, we have to consider the health of our populations and we can't have a healthy population without a healthy planet. Uh, the changes in climate, the changes in weather have implications for you know, the spread of disease and, and health conditions. The air that we breathe is hugely important. So for any government that has the health of its population at heart, and there can be fewer more important responsibilities, then tackling climate change has to be a top priority. Uh, I'm proud of the action Scotland's taken already. We've halved emissions already, but if we're to live up to our responsibilities under the Paris Treaty, we have to go further. So we aim to be carbon neutral by 2050, and we want to reach net zero of all greenhouse gas emissions as soon as we possibly can. And it's important that we show moral leadership uh, in the world uh, in order to encourage others to go faster as well. Music to my ears, as you might uh, expect, but truly I have followed uh, your record and your leadership. And as First Minister, you have vowed publicly to take, and I quote, world leading action on climate change. Uh, how are you working to keep Scotland mm -hmm. on track to meet these ambitious uh, mission goals uh, by 2020 and then go beyond? And uh, how is it that Scotland's progress has been faster than most other places in Europe? Well, partly it's political will, and we've got great consensus across the political spectrum in Scotland. Uh, sure, we disagree on some of the detail, but there is a great deal of consensus about the direction of travel. Uh, we also have massive renewable energy potential, and that has allowed us already to reach a position where around 70% of our electricity comes from renewable sources. Uh, we're now working towards a target of by 2030, 
at least half of all of our energy needs coming from renewable sources as well. So we're, we're blessed with the natural resources and coupling that with the political will, it means that we're able to go uh, faster than many others and that helps us to encourage others across the UK, across Europe and further afield to uh, follow on. But it's important that we continue to raise our ambition as well. Uh, the Paris Treaty uh, makes it necessary we do so. The IPCC report just a few weeks ago really is a call to action for all of us. None of us, even those of yeah. us who are in a leadership position here, none of us can afford to be complacent or rest in our laurels. Well, I, I love to hear that. And uh, this is not a question. I just want to interject uh, a comment about your emphasis on the importance of sufficient political will in Scotland. Um, many historians have written about the age of the Enlightenment, the age of reason. And perhaps it's my bias in favor of Scotland again, but I've always thought that the Scottish Enlightenment played a very special <laughs> role. Uh, and I kind of think that the legacy of that Scottish Enlightenment is still very much alive and is evident uh, in the political will that you referred to. But, but uh, tell us about the, the specific mm. goals and intention of Scotland's Climate Justice Fund. I, I'm so impressed by this. It just blows me away, as we say in America. Uh, how is this Climate Justice Fund being used to develop climate change mitigation projects uh, in select developing countries in Africa. That's a lot of political will to convince your people to support that. It's the right thing to do, but it, and it's so inspiring. But, but tell us about this uh, Climate Justice Fund. Well, I think Scotland was the first country anywhere in the world to establish a climate justice fund. And, you know, it's based on a very simple principle that I think more and more people adhere to. Uh, those that are suffering the biggest and worst impacts of climate change have done the least to cause climate change. So it's right and incumbent on developing countries that we put climate justice at the heart of everything we do. So the fund that we established works mainly in Malawi, Zambia and Rwanda, principally Malawi. And through the funding, that we've made available, we are taking a range of different actions, helping people in communities in Malawi to develop their own solutions to deal with the impact of climate change, uh, projects around water resource management. Uh, one that I'm particularly passionate about is uh, using the, the, the skills of our young people here in Scotland to develop young climate leaders in Malawi, where almost half of the population is under 18 years of age. Yeah. So across a whole range of different initiatives, uh, we are helping those countries adapt and deal with the impacts. And I think it's our duty to do so. Well, God bless the people of Scotland. And as I understand what you're saying, uh, you and the people Thank of Scotland you. have picked uh, a select number of developing countries, low income uh, low-income countries in sub-Saharan Africa that are highly vulnerable to the climate crisis, and you are helping them become more resilient uh, to the climate impacts uh, in that region. Isn't it, and it's true that you've uh, figured out that these projects will not only help these people who are vulnerable, but they will have global benefits as well. Do you, do you have any success stories you could share? Uh, well, some of the things I've been speaking about, these, these programmes and initiatives in a country like Malawi are already developing learning and, uh, and providing case studies. So particularly some of the work we're doing around water management and uh, developing uh, ways of, of, of uh, skills around water, uh, the, the work around capacity building of young people. These are all projects that are already delivering real benefits in Malawi and allowing others to learn from them. And, you know, in the process, I'm a great believer that, you know, the developed countries like ours, although we've got expertise to share and funding to bring to bear, uh, we should still also be able and willing to learn from others. And I see this very much as a two-way process for Scotland, that there's real benefits to us in this as well. And, you know, at home, we put a big emphasis on the just transition to 
a carbon neutral economy, uh, to make sure that we don't leave the vulnerable at home behind in that transition yeah. and that we're doing our best to make sure that the most vulnerable elsewhere in the world uh, get to, to come along with us too. Well, in that same spirit of uh, an openness to learning from others, uh, I note that last year uh, you signed a joint agreement with the governor of California, where I'm located now, Jerry Brown, uh, committing to work uh, with California uh, jointly to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, what does this partnership entail, and could it set an example for other regional, uh, subnational uh, government leaders, of course, uh, Scotland is in a special category, but could it uh, set a, an example for other leaders who also want to take urgent steps toward reducing carbon emissions? Yes, I hope it does set that example. The memorandum of understanding, the arrangement that Jerry Brown and I signed is part of the under two coalition, which is made up of around 200 sub-state actors looking to come together uh, to work out what more we can do at regional, uh, city, sub-state level. And it's a partnership that involves uh, principally an exchange of knowledge and understanding and expertise. And since we signed that agreement, we've seen an exchange of uh, policy officials, academics, experts, ministers. One of my ministers, uh, I think, joined you earlier this year at the uh, Global Climate uh, yeah. Action Conference in San Francisco. So it's a real way of developing and deepening our understanding of what we're doing. You know, California uh, has been keen to learn from Scotland's experience in wind power, offshore wind power included, and there's lots that uh, California is doing that we can learn from as well. So it's, it's a huge benefit to us, and I think it does set an example to others. Well, at the risk of repeating myself, I'm truly inspired. I wish we had more time for this conversation. I could talk to you for hours. Good luck Likewise. in the thank you. Good luck in the meetings in uh, Poland, where you are now thank you. located. Good luck in becoming a net zero emissions country by mid-century. And keep up the wonderful work. Uh, you are truly an inspiring leader. Uh, and perhaps I will see you at COP24 uh, later on. Thank you so much for being a part of 24 Hours of Reality.